guitar accidents are no doubt terrifying. Accidents like these leave guitar geeks feeling queasy, feeling short of breath. Just this general guitar geek anxiety ensues because we know guitars were probably harmed during any of those occurrences. But what if I said these were all preventable? You could use strap locks and then the guitar wouldn't fling off your neck. Now, I do realize that as an acoustic guitar player, you're probably not swinging the guitar around your neck. So that's a good thing, but we probably do all know one or two guitarists who've had mishaps with their acoustic guitar. And it usually involves a strap, and it usually involves the pickup input jack. And the strap falls right off that pickup input jack, and then the guitar plummets to injury or its ultimate doom. That's not a good thing, and that too is preventable. Actually, as of today, it's preventable because I just received a new product, and I wanted to share it with you all because it allows you to use strap locks with your acoustic guitar. Something that normally wasn't so easy, especially if you had a guitar with a pickup and that input jack. So here it is. It's the Acoustalock by Music Nomad. They sent me this to try out and I did that very thing. I tried it out on my Bourgeois Country Boy and it fits really, really well. And it, it's actually pretty easy to install. Now, before I go any further about the Acoustalock, I do wanna share with you how to put it on so you kinda of get an idea of what you're dealing with. So here's an installation video from the folks at Music Nomad. So it's quite easy to do. All you do is you undo your end cap. This is a Fishman electronic pickup system. It's a standard thread. So you just wanna take your standard threaded Acoustalock, thread it right back on, I'm gonna get in this snug tight position right there. You wanna have it slightly faced back towards your, where your body is. Um, and you can then take your strap lock and it snaps right in. Now, I know you're probably wondering, is it really that easy? And I'll have to say, yes, it actually is. It's very, very easy. Uh, within five minutes, I had the Acousta lock on my guitar. In fact, the hardest thing that I had, the, the biggest thing I had a hard time with was taking the end cap of the input jack off because it was kind of stuck a little bit. But after that, I just threaded this Acousta lock on and voila, it ended up in the right position. And even as you're threading it on, if it doesn't end up in the right position, there's a video on the Music Nomad website to show you how to adjust your input jack. So it's actually pretty easy. Now, a couple of things to know. First, this Acousta lock comes in three different varieties. Varieties, uh, standard threading, metric th threading, and then specifically for the Taylor Expression System, uh, the one that uses a nine volt battery. So be sure before you purchase one of these, you know what pickup system you have, specifically what type of input jack you have. Second, it comes in three different finishes. I believe the black, the chrome, and I think there's a gold available as well. You'd have to check the Music Nomad site just to double check my facts there, uh, but I'm pretty sure it comes in the three different finishes. Now, as I was installing this, I thought to myself, I don't know if I really buy it. Is it going to feel that solid once I actually get it on the guitar? But I'll tell you, it feels extremely solid. I tightened it down. There's no play whatsoever, and it works flawlessly, again, with those shallower strap locks. So if you are a strap lock loving guitar geek, and you've always wanted to use strap locks on your acoustic guitar, but didn't figure out how to do it with the input jack, now you actually have a way to do that with the Music Nomad Acousta Lock. Um, I'm really impressed. This seems, it's one of those simple things that all of a sudden somebody comes up with and puts out and it's like, wow, why didn't somebody think of that years ago? So kudos to the folks at Music Nomad for making a, a really simple solution to uh, something that could result in the harm of a guitar. To learn more about the Acoustalock, please visit acousticlife.tv forward slash AT101, where you can click on links to see the full installation videos, uh, click on the product links to learn more about the product itself, and then of course there are purchase links there as well. Okay, last week on Acoustic Tuesday, we celebrated our 100th episode with a guitarsonal extravaganza. I talked about how important this acoustic guitar community is and how awesome all of you guitar geeks are. And 
we actually looked at my top 10 torch bearing flat pickers, a list of 10 flat pickers that you need to know. So if you didn't see that, please go check that episode out. Of course, after watching this one, you're probably wondering what's coming up on this episode. Well, this week on Acoustic Tuesday, you've already learned how to lock down your acoustic guitar. We're gonna listen to a finger picking great and we're gonna head to Vegas to see what Brandon and Toby have in store. And a little birdie told me they're gonna share some news with us about one of my favorite players and probably one of your favorite players as well. So we're gonna get to that right after this. I'm Tony Polo Castro, and this is the Acoustic Tuesday Show. Guitar geeks, unite. Welcome to Acoustic Tuesday, episode 101. This is the show where you're gonna learn about acoustic guitar gear, discover acoustic artists, and most importantly, get inspired to live your very best acoustic life. As with all episodes of Acoustic Tuesday, I'm gonna share with you my guitar geek list for the week. And this week I am super excited to dig in, but first, an important order of business, your guitar geek trivia question. Who, along with Leroy Carr, played on the 1928 blues hit, How Long, How Blues? Was it A, Blind Boy Fuller, B, Blind Willie Johnson, C, Victoria Spivey, or D, Scrapper Blackwell? Go ahead and ponder that, and at the end of the show, I'll be sure to give you the answer. Now, before we dive into the rest of the Acoustic Tuesday show, I do want you to know that Acoustic Tuesday is brought to you by Tony's Acoustic Challenge. Are you tired of playing the same handful of things over and over? With Tony's Acoustic Challenge, you'll have more fun with your guitar while getting better in the process. This is done with an innovative method I call dynamic guitar learning. Log in every day to find a super fun 10 minute guitar challenge that rotates between the five essential categories of guitar improvement. Here's a recent five star review from Dennis S. Acoustic Tuesdays got me comfortable with signing on for tech. I thought it would either be good or a fool's money spent. I'm glad to say that interacting with tech is varied enough to keep one's attention. Lessons aren't pounded into the head, rather they are absorbed while engaging in a positive atmosphere. There is wonderful encouragement from community members too. Once in, I could see that there is room for anyone, both musically and socially. I'm excited with the prospects. I've had my hands on guitar since the early 60s and feel more comfortable now than ever before. I still need my fix of Acoustic Tuesdays though. To see why Tony's Acoustic Challenge has a 4.9 star rating from over 574 reviews, please visit guitarchallenge.com or click on the link in the description below. All right, well, I am ready to dig into the Guitar Geek list, but before we do so, I do have to introduce somebody very special, somebody behind the scenes, flipping buttons, doing switches, and adjusting other things that I have no clue what the hell they do. Ladies and gentlemen, Sir Noah Jacob Heckman Jr., the first. Tony, how's it going? Cheers to you, man. It's going hey. fantastic. It's been rather rainy and wet here in Montana, but that's not what I want to talk about because this isn't a show about the weather. Uh, Noah, I'm curious if you ever had a mishap with your acoustic guitar and or bass uh, while playing or while just messing around standing with the strap. Man, well, I've always been mindful of the strap slip. Oh, you mm -hmm, know, so mm -hmm. I'm, I'm proud to say it's, it's never, if it's come off, it's come off the butt end. Okay but I've always had my hand on the neck. Oh. So it's always been like the light <laughs> swing. Yeah. And I, I quickly figured out the straps that I liked and needed to use yeah. that alleviated that possibility. Nice. Plus I was never one to do the neck swing anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Neither was I for the record. <laughs> Any other mishaps, interestingly enough, came from it being on the stand. Oh, okay, sure. And that was probably one of the worst on my, on my Getty Lee signature. Oh and, no. And somebody was walking by, tipped it out of the stand. Oh no. But, yeah. I had one with my uh, acoustic guitar, my Martin HD 35. I was just playing around a campfire and it has the input jack, but I just had a strap on it as usual. And all of a sudden it was that weird swing thing. It was on the lower bout. The strap came unhinged and I was just holding the guitar at, with the neck and the, and the body was down here. And I was like, <gasps> it was like, I held my breath for the longest I think I've ever held my breath didn't because I out, saved it. Didn't swing out over the fire, did it? No, it did not swing out over the fire. Oh, okay. But all sorts of things could have went bad. I tell you what, though. If somebody comes up with a way to wear in like new leather strap ends, have you ever tried to get, you know, like when like the little slit Dude. for the knob is so tight? I know. And it takes you, yeah, it's not. I've fun. got a pro tip for you. Okay. Okay, because I figured out a way. Pro this tip is, me. This has bothered me for eternity. Okay. So you take your brand new strap. And this, this hurts a little bit, but just bear with me. I promise the results are good. You take a, a pair of scissors, 
and you put it through the, the hole of the strap and you just kind of twist it, work it around. What it does is it starts to kind of loosen up the leather on the strap end, and then you can actually get it over the input jack or the strap button if it's a larger one. So that, that's helped me in the past. Uh, but yeah, we're welcome to any other comments. For those of you who are breaking in straps and trying to get them over those pesky strap buttons, uh, leave a comment below. Let us know what you do to break in the strap. That would be great because it sounds like Noah is at a loss over there. Well, so <laughs> I, sit, I just sit down and play now. Yeah. <laughs> oh, forget it. I'm just going to sit down and play. Well, no, I'd love to move forward here because we're going to hear from a special guest that we haven't heard from in quite a while. This special guest is often mistaken for my brother, or rather me, his brother. Basically, if you saw us standing together, you'd think we were either in a band, a biker gang, or brothers, or all three. Uh, but yes, ladies and gentlemen, Matt C. from Eddie's Guitars is back for an Ask Matt section. We were delighted. He graced us with his presence here in the Acoustic Life studios, and we discussed some hot topics, and this is just one of them. So often people ask, hey, I have an opportunity to buy a new guitar. Should I go the vintage route or should I go the new guitar route? Because I'm not really sure what the pros and cons are of each. Well, Matt and I sat down and discussed this at length. So here's a quick snippet from our discussion. Yeah, that's a big subject, man. And, and really, as with almost anything else, it boils down to what's going to make you happy to play. Sure, you know, sure. that's really what it boils down to. That said, you know, at one time years ago, decades ago, there was a need for vintage instruments yeah. because at the time, and I'm talking in the 70s, 80s, especially in the acoustic world, a good acoustic guitar was hard to come by. And I'm talking even from companies like Gibson, Martin, oh, good, yeah. good companies. Yeah. The build quality was iffy in, in some right. of those time periods. Vintage instruments were a need at that point. Sure. They, offered, they offered tone and quality that yeah. wasn't being produced at that time. Right. Obviously, there was a huge answer to that with many of these um, both small and large makers uh, kind of making a, a big resurgence into guitar mm -hmm, making, mm -hmm. many of which uh, are were very, you know, very high end, very well executed, um, you know, very practiced craftsmanship into yeah. these instruments. And so the million dollar question here is you're walking down the street one day and you pass this stranger who sees that you have a beard and he says, you know what? This guy is clearly a guitar geek. He's got a beard. I'm going to go ahead and give him a hundred, a hundred grand. And then now here's Matt with a hundred grand in his, in his pocket. And he's faced with a decision between an opportunity buying a 1937 D28 in just primo shape or ordering a custom guitar. What does a, what does a guy like Matt do? That's that's personal, man. <laughs> um, I I'd have to say I think I'd go the route of new. You would? I think I would. Yeah, and the, I think the the reason I say that is the music that I play, I don't associate with vintage instruments. Okay, that's fair. If I was playing bluegrass music, my answer would be very different. I yeah. promise you that. <laughs> yeah. um, if I was playing ragtime, obviously my answer would be way different. Yeah. That's not really so much what I focus on personally. And I think contemporary instruments just as well, frankly, if not better, capture what I do in the crappy way I do it <laughs> uh, better than a, than a vintage one might, you know? It, I think that's a fair answer. I mean, I think it really goes back to understanding the pros and cons, weighing those, but also what you said right off the bat is what what brings you the player the most enjoyment right. and satisfaction. Right. I would have a hard time. I would take I know you would. I would take a different <laughs> angle. I would split the hundred grand, put fifty towards a different vintage instrument, and then put fifty towards a custom instrument. <laughs> fifty will get you a great D eighteen. I don't yeah. I don't know about a D twenty eight from fair. that era, but that's get, fair. get you a great D eighteen at least. <laughs> well thanks, man. I'll be sure to call you when that happens. <laughs> when that stranger walks by and gives me Well and send him my direction anytime you see him. Okay, so. we'll do. <laughs> 
All right, I hope you dug seeing Matt again. I certainly did. It's always fun to hang out with him. And then of course that hot button topic of vintage versus new. I still have a problem with that also. Uh, so you're not alone, Guitar Geek. You're not alone. We're all in this together. But hopefully that conversation uh, shed a little bit of light on the topic. And of course, if you want in on that full conversation, because that's not all we talked about. We talked about quite a bit of stuff. Uh, please go to acousticlife.tv forward slash vintage, and you'll be able to see that full conversation in all of its bearded and verbose glory. Yes, I said those two words in the same sentence. You're welcome. All right, I wanna move on, but I wanted to field a couple comments, or rather read a couple comments from Acoustic Tuesday viewers. Now these go back to Acoustic Tuesday episode 98, where we talked about three signs you should change your guitar strings. And the first comment comes from Aaron Essence, which I thought was a cool uh, tag there, or uh, a handle, uh, username, Aaron Essence. It makes me think of Evanescence, which I, was it Amy Lee who was in Evanescence? Was yep, that her name? That's correct. Yeah, I had a big time uh, crush on on her. Anyways, uh, that's not who we're talking about. We're talking about Erin Essence, and she left a comment, and she says, as a really new guitar player, I'm surprised at how frequently I need to change my strings. I start to see corrosion on them where I'm fretting the most, where I'm fretting the most, and figure it's time. Always shocked when I see folks say they only change them every three or six months. Well, I'm in your camp, Aaron, because I have to change my strings at least every two weeks. I have this bionic corrosive uh, perspiration that just seems to eat guitar strings for lunch. So I hear you, and uh, it's good to it's you know it's good practice to change your strings anyway. So I'm glad that you're able to see the signs and change them uh, accordingly. The next comment comes from Rick R. And this is in, in regards to the trivia question back on Acoustic Tuesday 98 about David Gilmore auctioning off his guitar collection. And Rick says this, the Martin D35 sell price is quite impressive. However, check this out. His 69 Strat just sold at auction for $3.9 million, a single guitar, $3.9 million. His total collection of 126 guitars sold for 21 million. The truly impressive part is that he's donating the money to fight climate change. And then he goes on to talk about our musical uh, guest or musical feature for that episode. He says, Mandolin Orange are an overnight sensation, 11 years in the making. Seeing them in September at the Ryman. So very cool, Rick. Thank you for leaving your comments. And of course, if you haven't left a comment yet on today's episode of Acoustic Tuesday, please do so because we want to know how you are liking the show so far. And as you leave that comment, please include where you're tuning in from. And also, as you're leaving that comment, please ask yourself, hey, have I subscribed to the Acoustic Life YouTube channel? Because if not, please do so right now. Hit that red subscribe button. Don't forget to hit that little gray bell. That'll give you a notification of each and every new video that gets posted. And then one last thing, if you could please like this episode of Acoustic Tuesday, I would really appreciate it, but more so, all of the guitar geeks who will discover the show because you liked it will also appreciate it. When you like the episode of Acoustic Tuesday, you're letting YouTube know that, hey, guitar geeks really like this show, and we should actually put this in front of more guitar geeks. So you're actually helping the Acoustic Tuesday dream come true. That dream of uniting guitar geeks every single Tuesday just by liking, just by pressing that little thumbs up button. So please do that. We would certainly appreciate it. All right, moving on. I wish I could rent out a private plane to hire to 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 bring all of us guitar geeks down to Vegas just for a weekend of guitar geeking and overall guitar geek debauchery is that a thing uh, I don't know if that's a thing bottom line I would love for us all to go and visit Brendan at Heartbreaker to, uh, Brendan at Heartbreaker Guitars down in Vegas but alas I I looked into the rental prices and it's just it's I can't even fathom having that much money. So we can't do that, but I want you to close your eyes. Imagine you're in a time travel machine and you're going to Vegas and you're going to visit Brendan at Heartbreaker Guitars because actually Brendan's here and he's gonna share with us some amazing news from the front lines of the acoustic guitar industry featuring two of my favorite guitar brands, one of my favorite players. I cannot wait for you to, to hear what Brendan has to say because it totally blew my mind and it's gonna blow yours as well. So without further ado, here's Brendan from Heartbreaker Guitars. Thanks, Tony. Hey guys, what's going on? It's Brendan from Heartbreaker Guitars. It's me and my pal Toby here today reporting from the front lines of Acoustic Tuesday. And guys, we have got some amazing stories for you today to report. So let's dive right in. Okay, one, we've got bourgeois guitars, guys. 
Dana Bourgeois has come up with some new options for his guitars that are gonna blow your mind. They are so amazing. So we're gonna jump into that. Next, we've got a couple stories from Larravee Guitars. Jean Larravee has come up with two brand new guitar models and you gotta check these out. And one of them, Tony, I am so pumped about. Dude, wait till you see what we got in store from Jean Larravee Guitars. Okay guys, first on deck, Bourgeois Guitars. You know, a lot of people don't know it, but when people order guitars from these small bench luthiers, they might not realize that the luthiers themselves, they have a crew, they have a group of workers that participate in the building of the guitars. In many cases, it's as many as 10, 15 builders, and sometimes it's as few as two or three. But usually there are other builders, luthiers, within the store that are working. In this case with Dana Bourgeois. So what Dana is doing, you guys, he is creating two really cool new options. Now some builders out there are already doing this, but everybody has their own take on it. So what Dana is doing is he's op offering a sound box bevel, an arm bevel, some people call it, as well as a sound port. So two brand new options, the sound port and the arm bevel. Okay, guys, this thing is amazing. Okay, these pictures that you're seeing now are the first two prototypes of the bevel and the sound port. Now, those ones that you're seeing, the one with the Brazilian rosewood, that one is actually gonna be available from the good people at Eddie's Guitars in St. Louis. And this one, the Koa, will be available at Heartbreaker Guitars. So guys, do check them out. This is a brand new option. You're gonna be seeing it on more and more bourgeois guitars, but you know, as per usual, when Dana does something, he does it to the T and it's amazing. And the reason why I was bringing up the other crew besides Dana is that Dana has made it a point going forward with some of these new options to include his extremely talented crew. So it's Dana working in tandem with his builders to create these killer options. Now, prices, are you sitting down? Okay, it's gonna be 2,500 bucks for the bevel and it's 1,350 for the sound port. Yeah, I know, that's a lot of money. But guys, when you're talking handmade instruments, that's the cost of doing business. They are expensive, but man, when you see it, does it like the lines on a Cadillac, man. These things are gorgeous. So do check them out. Okay, guys, next on deck, Larrabee Guitars. And Tony, oh my gosh, I am so psyched about these new guitars that are coming out. Wait till you see what Jean Larrabee out of California has on deck for you guys. Okay, this is the T40, okay. This is a travel size guitar that was unveiled at NAMM 2019. Now, they only had a couple there. They sold them, they went to Europe. This is actually the first prototype that is going to be available in the United States, okay? So you're gonna start seeing these at shops across the country. So what this is, it's a travel size guitar, but this is no toy guitar, you guys, okay? It's smaller than a parlor, parlor but this thing is hand built in California by Jean Larrabee. And I'm telling you guys, per usual, nothing but handmade quality from Jean Larrabee. It's got a one and three quarter inch nut. It's got a 22.8 scale length, inch scale length. It's got Sitka spruce. It's got mahogany with maple binding. And I'm telling you, this thing is amazing. I'm gonna shoot over to Mike for a quick sound clip of the T40. Check this out, you guys. We had a chance to meet Jean Larravee at NAMM 2019 and talk to him a little bit about his guitars. Jean Larravee has been building guitars for 50 years and everybody in the industry respects this guy because he does it right. Anybody who's held or played a Larravee guitar can see and feel and hear the quality in these instruments. Jean Larravee defines value. This is one guitar builder where you don't have to spend $10,000 to get an amazing instrument. Gene Larrabee is humble, he's cool, he's talented, and he's just an amazing dude. Pick up one of his guitars, you're going to see exactly what I'm talking about. We are proud to deal with this guy, he is amazing. As usual guys, I have saved the best for last. Are you ready? Okay. We've got a brand new tribute guitar from Gene Larrabee for, are you ready? Da 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 da!
Tommy Emmanuel. Guys, Gene Larrabee is building a guitar in tandem with Tommy Emmanuel. Yes, Tommy is still doing his signature series with Maiden Guitars, amazing instrument, but basically what they've done here is they met about 20, 25 years ago, and at the time, Jean Larrabee built a recording guitar. It was uh, based on a C10. He used that to record in a lot of his albums. So about 20 years ago, Jean Larrabee created a guitar for Tommy Emmanuel, and Tommy used it over the years for recording and whatnot, and basically they're creating a new signature guitar that is a loose replica of that instrument. It's basically a no-frills, copy of that old guitar. That old guitar which was based on a C10. Now the new one is an 03. It's got a Florentine cutaway. It's got Sitka Spruce. It's got Indian Rosewood. It is a 12 fret. And basically when they got together to decide to do this, uh, Tommy Emanuel wanted it to be kind of a no frills, very affordable guitar. And the price tag on this Tommy Emanuel signature, guys, are you ready? 2,000 bucks. 2,000 bucks for a handmade Jean Larravee USA built custom guitar. Now guys, I mean, all the builders have one or two signature series at least, and usually the price tag gets up there. So basically what you've got here, you've got an 03 cutaway that was loosely based on the C10 that Tommy used about 20 years ago that was built by Jean Larravee. And he basically told Jean, he said, you know, let's make this affordable, let's make it, you know, handmade quality, but I wanna make this accessible to players that want to play a guitar that is just like mine. So basically, this is a no frills, no inlay, straight up 03 Florentine cutaway that Tommy Emanuel designed with Jean Larravee to create an amazing acoustic instrument. So anyway, guys, you're looking at about four months before you're gonna actually see these things in stores. And we got dibs on one of the first ones. So as soon as we get it, we're not only gonna bring it to you, but we're gonna do sound clips, we're gonna show you nice photographs of the guitar and give you much more information about all the details of the Tommy Emanuel signature. So guys, from Larrabee Guitars, do look out for the Tommy Emanuel Signature Guitar. Okay guys, that's a wrap. I wanna thank you all for watching. This is Brendan from Heartbreaker Guitars and Toby the Beagle signing off from the Heartbreaker Lounge at the back of the store. Thanks for watching. Tony, back to you my friend. All right, I wanna thank Brendan and Toby for being such wonderful news correspondents and just delivering the goods. They, they come up with the juiciest acoustic stories and I am so pumped. Seeing those bourgeois options really started to get my guitar geek heart fluttering. And then hearing about what Larave has up their sleeve is just all in all ridiculously exciting. Um, yeah, Tommy Emanuel, I mean, come on. He's been my favorite guitar player for a really long time. He's probably one of your favorite guitar players as well. So to hear that they're gonna be working on a special model is really, really exciting. Now, I do have an artist that I cannot wait for you to hear. A finger picking great, indeed. Uh, we have to visit the mailbag. There's a whole slew of stuff next to me. I cannot wait for you to see it. It runs the gamut from music to hockey to just overall geeky cool things. And, of course, your trivia answer is coming up. But I wanna feature a couple more comments, rather questions, uh, back from Acoustic Tuesday, episode 98. This first question comes from Robert W. He says, question. I have always used Daddario Phosphor Bronze. Recently, I saw there was a coated version. Has anyone tried them, and do they sound as good as the uncoated? The salesman at GC said they don't dull the brightness like other coated strings. I tried Elixirs a few years ago and did not think they sounded nearly as good as the, D the Daddario uncoated. I don't care how long a string lasts, I just want the best tone. Well, Robert, thank you for this question. I have had a chance to try the Daddario coated strings. I believe you're referring to the EXP strings. I've tried them on my Bourgeois OMSC, my Martin HD35, and my Martin OM28 Marquee. And I have to say, uh, my experience with the strings is that I really didn't like them that much. They, they sounded a little dull to me. They sounded a little bit um, almost, almost lifeless. Now, again, this is my experience. This is not the definitive, these strings sound exactly like this because we all like different attributes in our guitar strings. This is just my experience. And, uh, and, and it's funny because I like the Daddario, the standard like EJ-17, it's just the standard phosphor bronze uncoated. I think they sound great. I think they sound brilliant and articulate. In fact, I use those as backup strings for most of my guitars because they're priced right and I, they're just really dependable. But the EXPs, I'm not a huge fan 
fan of. Uh, but I want to encourage anybody who's tried them, who's watching this show right now, to please leave, please leave a comment below and help Robert out. What's your experience with the Daddario EXPs or for any other string for that matter? Maybe there's another string you think Robert should try out. If that's the case, please leave a comment below. We love to hear from him. We'd love to help another guitar geek out in need. And then our next question comes from Joelle K. And she says, how about guitar string cleaners? Are they any good? Do they work? I'm in love with that beautiful bourgeois, that sound, that fingerboard. I hope some will come to the Netherlands. I looked mandolin orange up on Spotify. I love it. Thanks for sharing all of this. Well, thank you for watching, Joelle. And thanks for the kind words about uh, the bourgeois and also uh, mandolin orange. Fantastic folk duo. Again, if you haven't heard of them, uh, please check them out back on Acoustic Tuesday episode 98. But her question about string cleaners really hits me hard because I have a problem, as I mentioned before, with this, this caustic sweat. Uh, literally, I just eat through guitar strings. And Noah's actually worked out next to me in a workout class and he just, he can see how much perspiration actually happens. Anyways, that's a whole nother story. Uh, but, but I will say that guitar string cleaners are effective, but they essentially just delay the inevitable. Uh, guitar string cleaners aren't this magic fountain of youth that will make one string set last forever they will kind of delay the corrosion. And I would strongly advise using them. In fact, uh, Music Nomad, the same folks that made the Acoustilock, have a wonderful string cleaner that is a, it's a device that goes underneath the strings on the fretboard side and then clamps, uh, there's a clamp and it goes over the string. So you can actually clean both sides of the string and you can use that with any string cleaner. I believe Music Nomad sells one as well. But also I'll recommend, uh, GHS Fast Fret or the Daddario Accelerate. Uh, both of those products are fantastic in keeping strings uh, kind of fighting off corrosion. I know I've used those things in the past. Noah uses them currently on his bass and they do seem to extend string life just a little bit, but again, it's no, um, it's no fountain of youth for the strings. They will eventually corrode, but in terms of delaying that corrosion, guitar string cleaners and things of the like are a fantastic thing to use. And I think you should definitely try them because they're usually pretty inexpensive. I would say anywhere from uh, 10 to 25 bucks. And I'm talking both the actual cleaning apparatus and the solution. So yeah, definitely give it a shot. Thanks for the question, Joel, and uh, thanks for watching again. I definitely appreciate it. All right. Wow, are we really over to, oh, we're gonna hit the mailbag. That's what we're gonna do, Noah. I was, I was looking, I was like, are we really on the Artist of the Week already? Because I'm excited to dig into the Artist of the Week, but uh, alas, we have to hit the mailbag first. Now, wow, we got a lot to go through, so I'm just gonna speed round it. Uh, first, I pre-ordered Jessica Hoop's new album, Stone Child, some months ago. It finally came in as a true music geek. I ordered the signed copy, I'm pretty excited about that. So thank you, Jessica, for making amazing music. And if you're not familiar with Jessica Hoop, you may wanna check out Acoustic Tuesday episode number 10. Yes, uh, way back in the archives, we featured Jessica Hoop and Sam Beam doing a duo album, and it is amazing. Again, that's Acoustic Tuesday episode number 10. Also got a very kind letter from the folks at Fur Guitars, and, and it says, let us say thanks for reviewing our guitars. Satisfaction of our customers is very important to us and positive response such as yours gives us energy and motivation to continue the way we work. Please accept a small gift. Uh, so I wanna thank them for sending such a kind note and also a really, really nice guitar strap. Nice first guitar strap, which I'm pretty pumped about. And then, uh, and also a really cool t-shirt that actually feels so nice. I think it feels so good next to my skin. I'm really pumped. So thanks to the folks at Furt Guitars. Very much appreciate that. Next up, I got a card. We got a card, I should say, not I got a card. Oh, sorry, I'm, I'm included in I'm, this one? I'm sorry, bud. I'm, so <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, I, I, I'm just gonna reveal what came with this card. They're, um, I'm not sure, they're, they're candies from Sweden. And they're like monkey candies. So I figured we could go down this rabbit hole together. We could try these out a little okay. bit later, maybe. Okay. All right. um, but uh, let me read the card. As my folks say, you, you should always read the card first before you open the gift. Generally, I do things in the opposite order, but I'm trying to be better. Uh, the card says, hi, Tony. Just wanted to say thank you for the inspiration. You got me playing acoustic guitar more regularly. Thanks for great acoustic guitar reviews as well, as well as online guitar lessons. And thanks, Tony, Noah, and Levi for Acoustic Tuesday. What a great TV show. I sent you guys some candy and pics. Have a good time. Kind regards, John L. from Eskilds. Eskilstuna, Sweden. 
He's also a member of the We Play Acoustic Guitar Everyday Facebook group. So he included some pics in there. Hopefully y'all can see those. So I wanna thank John L for sending that all the way from Sweden, that's very cool. And last but certainly not least, this has nothing to do with guitar or music for that matter. I ordered some new goalie gear, so check this out. I got a new blocker, right? Check that out, that's cool. I got a new glove, because the season's kind of coming up. I'm just excited. I haven't played hockey in a while um, since last season, and I'm just getting bored, so I figured ordering new gear would help. And I got new leg pads, and I'm really pumped about these, because they actually make they, they actually match the team that I'm on, the colors. So I, I, I'm really leveling up my fashion game on the ice. So that's the mailbag. Noah, does, did you does, get anything? Does this, I'm sorry to hear that question, but <laughs> um, does this mean that when you house your new gear downstairs that it won't smell as bad? There'll be about a one month period where it won't smell. Okay. And then it will. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I was told... Uh, a couple, two seasons ago, because I would, the rink's just down the street from Acoustic Life Studios, and I would just go play hockey, and I'd bring my stuff here, and it would sit in the basement. Very quickly, my fellow studio mates, i.e. Noah and Levi, uh, told me to get my gear the hell out of the basement, because it smells absolutely horrible. Uh, as hockey gear does. Life Lessons on Acoustic Tuesday. What can I say? <laughs> All right, moving on to the artist of the, week, of the week. Here's what we're listening to this week. This week, we have an artist that um, is one of... Let, bottom line, as a guitar geek, you have to know this artist. This artist is John Renborn. Now, John Renborn is best known for his collaborations with Bert Janch, which led to the uh, invention, discovery, the creation of the folk group Pentangle. But all along, through the various duo collaborations and Pentangle, uh, John Renborn has, has kept a solo career going. He's been releasing albums under his own name. I'm sorry, he said, I, I should have said he was releasing albums under his own name because John passed away in 2015. But uh, he left a large legacy of music to dig through and dig through it we will. Just so you know who he is and how he sounds, let's first listen to the tune Lord Franklin as played by John Renborn. <laughs> I dreamed a dream, and I thought it true. All right, there's actually a very specific part of his playing that I want to cite and, and tell you to watch, but I won't do that for a second, because I mentioned Pentangle, and then I thought, well, there might be some folks that have never heard of Pentangle, and they were just a, this awesome, I'll call him a f experimental folk group. I'll just call him a folk group. Um, you'll see, because I wanted to, just to do John justice and really show his diversity and his creativity, I wanted to show off a, a tune from the group Pentangle. So here is the hunting song by none other than Pentangle. <laughs> Now, as we were rehearsing for the show today, Noah said we were going through the videos and stuff, and, and Noah let that one play unusually long. And I was thinking to myself, I'm like, Noah, are you going to let that play? Like, what's going on? He's like, I don't know why. He's like, I'm mesmerized by this. Can you explain a little bit more what was going on in your head? Do you, do you know exactly why you were mesmerized? Yeah, well, I guess there were some, there's a couple things there. <laughs> okay, I'll just say it. I'm a, I'm a big fan of The Last Unicorn. Okay, mm -hmm. if anyone has seen that animated feature from kind of back in the day with Jeff Bridges, uh, Christopher Lee, based off the Peter S. Beagle book. There's some nerd info for you. <laughs> but anyway, so for whatever reason, that whole and not to mention that I thought like Jim Morrison was going to step out on the stage at any moment as well. Oh, my God. It's funny you said that. I was just watching a documentary about the doors. Sorry. Keep all going. right. But just that vibe and then just the the. 
the all the instruments that are there just yeah. just morphing together and and her voice and the style of it which yeah. I think is very specific to that time. I don't know. I just got I just got lost. And you just got and, you got you went back into the archives, huh? That's what happened. Fair enough. Fair enough. Well, that was just a taste of 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 how Pentangle sounds. Again, that was the hunting song uh, by them. But I also wanted you to know that you know John played. I mean, he lived music essentially through his whole life. Again, as I mentioned, he passed in 2015, and I found I wanted to find a performance from later in his career, and I believe this is from uh, 2011, 2012, and he picked a Reverend Gary Davis tune, uh, the tune Candyman, to play. And the thing that I want you to watch is his right hand, his picking hand. It is completely effortless. He's not, it doesn't seem to be anchoring at all. He's hitting the strings with such accuracy, but little to no effort. It's like he's not even trying. It's really a treat to watch. I mean, it's it's great to listen to as well, but I thought this really illustrated how how masterful his picking hand is. So without further ado, here's John Renborn playing the tune Candyman. <laughs> give you a rundown of some of the albums I think you should own or at least listen to by John Renborn. Uh, first, The Hermit. Next up, The Lady and the Unicorn. And following that, uh, probably his most uh, popular album, I would, I would say. I, I would say it's one you absolutely need to hear. It's called Sir John a lot. And then the next one, now this is one he did with Stefan Grossman, who's a fantastic acoustic picker as well. Uh, um, very creatively named Stefan Grossman and John Renborn. I actually found that at a thrift store and I was really pumped. I was, it was like I won the lottery. And then last but certainly not least, Pharaoh Annie, which I think if you were to get only two on this list, Sir John Lott would be one and then Pharaoh Annie would be two. Uh, fantastic albums and I think just a great showing of John Renborn's true, true artistry. So there you have it. That's John Renborn. To learn more about him, please visit AcousticLife.tv forward slash AT101. But... Also, I wanted to mention, if you like the way John sounds, there's two artists that we've featured previously on Acoustic Tuesday that I think you'd dig. Uh, back on Acoustic Tuesday, episode 84, John Doyle, and then back on Acoustic Tuesday, way back, Acoustic Tuesday, episode 54, Tony McManus. Definitely uh, two artists that you will enjoy if you like what you heard from John Renborn. Wow, we're almost through, Noah. Tony, well, I realized yeah. in my blathering yeah. before, I don't even. I don't think I connected the dots on John and the Last Unicorn. What do you mean? I just wanted to make the point that the Last Unicorn soundtrack oh. is one of my favorites. Okay, you know, I see. And a lot of the songs from that were really all the performed songs from that soundtrack is by America. Was written and performed mm. by America. But there's also some compositional elements, and that pentangle scene yeah. reminded me a lot of that vibe. I gotcha. So, okay. Go. Thank you for making that connection. Uh, now, Noah, you had mentioned before that um, since our trivia question was involved w uh, with some some blues artists yes. and the options, let me just give you a quick recap of the Guitar Geek trivia so you know what I'm talking about. Here's the question. Who, along with Leroy Carr, played on the 1928 blues hit, How Long, How Blues? Was it A, Blind Boy Fuller, B, Blind Willie Johnson, C, Victoria Spivey, or D, Scrapper Blackwell? Now, as I was listing out these names, Noah was like, what's your blues name? And I'm like, what are you talking about what my blues name is? I don't have a blues name. So then Noah, in his, his uh, scouring of the internet, found a, a guide to naming yourself your true blues name based on your initials. Yes. So my initials, Tony, Stephen, Policastro. T gave me the, um, the word big, correct? Yes. S was bad boy. Correct. And then P was uh, Bradley. Yes. So my official blues name is Big Bad Boy Bradley. Um, 
I don't know if I'll be using that. But Noah, do, do, what's yours? Do you know what yours is? Sure. Uh, I'm going to leave the camera on you just so I can see your reaction. Oh, okay. okay. Yours was actually pretty cool. Yeah. But then you take someone like me, Noah, Jacob, Heckman, and you get, hold on, here we go. You get peg leg, fingers, rivers. Peg leg, fingers, rivers? <laughs> That's my blues. Peg leg, name. fingers, rivers. Peg leg, fingers, rivers. Wow. Uh... I think I won that one. I think you did too. Yeah. <laughs> I, I will gladly give you that one. And Tony, yes. uh, to be fair, I think the first time I heard of finding out your blues name yeah. might have been from the uh, Play Guitar Every Day Facebook page. Oh, I think you're correct. So Somebody posted. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Well, thank you, Guitar Geeks. We're all on the same page. It's clear. It's very clear. Uh, well, here's your answer. Um, so if you answered D... Scrapper Blackwell to that question, you're absolutely correct. Between 1928 and 1935, Scrapper Blackwell and his partner pianist Leroy Carr were the most popular blues duo in America. Their first lit, their first hit, How Long, How Blues, was the top blues song of 1928. In fact, so many copies were pressed, it caused the original Metal Masters to wear out. Vocalion Records called Carr and Blackwell back into the recording studio twice to record How Long How Blues number two and How Long How Blues number three. Unlike the tragic stories of many other bluesmen, Vocalion paid the duo fairly, each netting $4,000, which translates to $55,000 in today's money, and they continued to get royalty checks every six months. Check this out, though. There's always a turn, right? Here's the turn. Feeling slighted for Carr's top billing, and often omitting Scrapper Blackwell's own name on the label, Scrapper entered the recording studio in 1931 and 1932 to cut some incredible solo records under his own name. And here's where it gets good, because he's definitely my style. As a former bootlegger, he often sang of making and drinking homemade whiskey, such as Down in Black Bottom. So there you have it, a little guitar geek history, a little whiskey infusion, you got the blues. It's all there. It's all there here on Acoustic Tuesday, so you need to tell your friends to watch and check out the Acoustic Tuesday show. And speaking of that, Noah, we have, we've filled the cart with all the appropriate groceries. We have wheeled it throughout the aisles of the supermarket and checked the list made sure we had all of the appropriate ingredients for the dinner that we're going to make. And lo and behold, we've made the dinner and presented it to the Guitar Geeks, the dinner that is Acoustic Tuesday. We've consumed that dinner, and now we sit with full bellies, warm hearts, and a smile on our faces, and we say thanks. We, th we say thanks to Guitar Geeks. And we take a sneak peek and see what's going to happen next week on Acoustic Tuesday. <laughs> Next week on Acoustic Tuesday, you're going to get a chance to win a guitar by living your best acoustic life. Yes, you can actually win a guitar. I will share the details with you next week. Uh, you're going to learn about and listen to a percussive fingerstyle guitarist with luscious locks. Yes, hair, real hair. And you're going to learn about the magic progress fuel that every single guitar journey needs. That's all going to happen next week on Acoustic Tuesday. We thank you for sharing your time this week with us on Acoustic Tuesday. Remember, you can catch Acoustic Tuesday every single Tuesday at 10 a.m. Mountain Time here on YouTube. And for your Acoustic Tuesday fix in between Tuesdays, please visit AcousticLife.tv, where you can do a deep dive on anything I've ever talked about on Acoustic Tuesday. Thank you so much for sharing your time with us today. Thank you so much for being a guitar geek and thank you for being a part of this wonderful guitar geek community remember guitar geeks unite and we'll see you next tuesday Thanks.